Again, thank you for having me. Thank you for sticking it out at the end of the day. Um, my talk is going to be uh, Trolls of 2013. I'm Ryan Davis, CLRB. Uh, Setting some expectations. Uh, this is a follow up to my talk, uh, Occupy Ruby, Why We Can Moderate the 1% that I gave last year at Cascadia RubyConf. Um, it's 130 slides in 30 minutes, 4.3 slides per minute, so I'm going to have to go really, really fast. So please hold your questions till the end. And actually, this is all a lot. What really happened was I tweeted that I was done with my slides for Mountain West and someone that I called out as a troll last year, and I've been butt hurt since, uh, said, let me guess, the title of your talk is Trolls 2013. So for fun, I got a, together with Mike and decided to troll the troll, and that's what the title of this talk is. <laughs> the actual talk is, let's write an interpreter. <gasps> no way! What I'm actually doing is 160 slides in 30 minutes by 3 slides per minute. I do have buttloads of content, almost all of this code, and I was asked to do this somewhere to hurt brains, and I have every intention of doing that. I will be going incredibly fast. Much of what I go over is a pattern, and then I will revisit it many, many times. Um, so you don't need to understand the first thing to be able to understand the third, so just bear with me and it should show. I was told a few days ago that my talk was expanded 45 minutes. I did rehearse this for 30 minutes, and that's what I intend to stick to. So I have a 15 minutes of at the end. <laughs> um, so the real first question is, why would you ever want to do this? Um, I had a couple of talks with people last night, and uh, basically, you know, we use interpreters every day. Ruby's an interpreter, Fash is an interpreter. Nearly everything we interact with is an interpreter in one way or another. Um, but I think conceptually this is one of those things like Lisp where if you learn it, it alters your brain in usable ways. They're very useful ways. Um, so it's not entirely because I'm a pervert. I, I am in a sense. Uh, this is one of my nerdy perversions, but really it's because we can and because it will alter the way we think. Um, so real quick show of hands of people who have CS backgrounds that took uh, either formal language theory or uh, otherwise wrote interpreters in school. Um, so this talk is not necessarily for you, but I might go over tools that you're familiar with that you might want to learn. So we're going to go over the Ubi interpreter. It is a very small subset of Ruby. It is going to contain uh, branching logic, while loops, local variables with uh, Alabama versions of Pi. Uh, functions. Um, this is the most complex hunk of code. I expect you to be able to understand this talk. Uh, anything I have that's larger, um, I might be glossing over it on purpose, or I'm going to be going into detail on it, and it's really the details are not that important for anything larger than this. Um, in this function, you can see that we have local variables. We have what's called primitive function calls, stuff that's going to be supported by the underlying runtime. And then we have user functions. Uh, and in this case, those new function calls are recursive. So the Ubi roadmap looks kind of like this. We have the parser with runtime, uh, the environment sitting on top of that, uh, loops, variables, and conditionals, and then on top of all that stuff are obviously functions. Uh, I do all of my parsing using a gem called Ruby Parser. Um, it will take Ruby source code like this and parse it and output something that conceptually looks like this. It is confusing at first, but uh, eventually you will see blondes, brunettes, and redheads. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for now, we're just going to mentally pull apart the clusters uh, one at a time until you can start to see some pattern of the structure itself. And eventually, you'll see something that looks like this. In the green is an if node. That if node has a condition case, the top box, uh, the, se the second box, uh, the true case, um, and a false case that has the sum of two recursive calls. All in all, there's five boxes here. Uh, what we're going to be looking at, though, are not pretty little boxes, because coding has a dot map. It looks like this instead. 
Uh, but if we look at this and you study it for a little bit, you're going to see one, two, three, four, five boxes where we have if, condition, true case, false case, with some of the two groups of calls and true. It's exactly the same thing one to one with the diagram before. Uh, and, and this is what we're going to be doing. So let's go over some vocabulary real quick. Uh, this is called an S expression. We get that terminology from uh, Lispers. Uh, they are henceforth known as sex keys. They have a head, which in our case is going to be the type of the node that we parsed. Uh, in list plant, that's also known as the car. They're going to have a rest. The list plant that is a cutter, and that rest may have uh, some sex keys in it. So we get all that for free using the reparser gem. I'm not going to go over it anymore. Uh, parsing's really hard. It is its own talk, uh, if not its own semester. And uh, I think it's rather boring compared to the actual contents. <coughs> uh, if you want to study up on parsers further, uh, Michael Jackson gave a talk two years ago called Parsing Expressions in Ruby. The video is up on conference. It is very good. He is going over a different type of parser than uh, the type that I'm using, but that's actually a consequential before this talk. Uh, so let's talk about interpreting. So this is the meat, the runtime. How does one get 7 from 3 plus 4? The first thing that happens is you start with the source. You ask parse tree or whatever parser you have to parse it. You get an AST back, or in this case, uh, a SXP. You process by type. First with the inner values. Now this is how most languages do it. It's how Ruby does it and uh, pretty much everything else you've ever used. Um, that's called applicative order evaluation, but it doesn't have to be this way. Some languages choose not to, uh, and that gives them a lot of flexibility. Basically, it allows them to do macro systems without macro systems. Um, and how you do yours is entirely up to you. So we start off with that uh, lit free, and we interpret its value to be free. We move on to the next inner subset and interpret lit four to be four. Then we move on to the outer node, where we have call, three, plus one, four. And in this case, let's say we look up a proc that represents the condition uh, operation. And we call that proc with three and four. And out comes seven. This is just one way to do it. For the sake of time, I'm going to be using Ruby itself to define and implement much of the semantics of this language. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as a metacircular interpreter. Hurting looks like it might be too much. Maybe? Mike? Okay. Um, SexP processor provides us with um, a dispatch to process methods based on the node type. So when we come across lit3 and we ask SexP processor, processor to process it, it's going to dispatch it off to process lit based on that first uh, node, uh, first symbol in the, the SexP. Um, we're also going to be doing test-driven interpreters. That adds another box to our roadmap that spans the entire thing. And we're going to be doing unit tests that have an input source and an expected value and just do an assert equal. There's nothing really important about this or, or magic about this. It's the way I would do most projects. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm going to prematurely refactor this into assert eval. It's going to be calling uh, lang.eval on the source itself, get the value back, and assert the, the result to be equal to what we expect. In this way, we can say assert eval 7 from 3 plus 4. So let's work on that. Let's get our sanity test working. Let's implement our runtime. Let's implement our test infrastructure. I'm going to prematurely refactor some of our infrastructure. I'm going to start off with the setup. I normally wouldn't do that, um, but I am going to fit this into 21 more minutes. Uh, let's instantiate an Ubi interpreter instance. Let's define a cert eval and give us an accessor to uh, the interpreter. And then I'm going to add our first test. New code is going to be bold. Old code is going to be emitted. And so to start, we're going to interpret the atom 3 and expect the value of 3. And then we're going to uh, parse 3 plus 4 or interpret 3 plus 4 and expect the value of 7. Uh, 3 plus 4 is a standard sanity test from Smalltalk. When you're bootstrapping a new one, that's generally what you start with to prove that you have gotten as far as you have. Um, and I'm going to honor that. So the first thing that happens when we save that and run it is we get uninitialized constant Ubi interpreter. This is really simple. We haven't implemented anything, so it doesn't know what the hell we're talking about. So we subclass XP interpreter. 
Uh, we name it Ubi Interpreter. I throw in a version constant in order to make my rake tasks shut up. And we move on to a slightly confusing error. Because I named it eval, our, our entry point into this, um, and that is overwriting the eval method in kernel, uh, but we haven't implemented it yet, um, we're getting a private method error instead of a regular no method error, and that's fine. So we move on to implementing uh, some meat in our Ubi interpreter. Uh, this is uh, eval and friends. Um, and the only thing you need to worry about is that red line. So we take the source that you're uh, being asked to eval, we pass that off to the parser and get a sexp back, and then we pass that off to sexp interpreter's process method. We've inherited that, so we don't need to worry about it. And we finally get to the error message that I want us to see. We finally get unnode node type lit. And that's because we came across a node that the system hasn't defined yet. And so sexp uh, interpreter uh, goes ahead and uh, raises this error for us. So we've talked about process lit a number of times now. So we're just going to implement it as is. And that's going to move us on to our second assertion where we get unnode node type call. Call's more complex. I'm not going to cheat on this one. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to raise on the inspect of the S expression to begin with. It's kind of a roundabout way to do it, but it allows us to see the pieces as they come and allows us to deal with this in small incremental changes. I've color coded this so that we can help connect the dots. We can see here that we have the node type of call, a receiver of the literal three, the message plus, and a single argument of the literal four. So now that we've seen the pieces, we're going to use multiple assignment to non-destructively unpack that uh, from S into named arguments so that we can deal with them easier. So we unpack into underscore for the node type, since we don't care about it, uh, receiver, message, and star args to get the rest of it. We're going to change our arrays to show the components as they are, rerun the test, and see that we did it correctly. From here, we know that we can work on the subsex piece, so we go ahead and implement that. We say that the receiver is equal to the recursive process of receiver. That's the lit three. And then we walk over args and map bang that to the recursion on them. That's, in this case, the lit four. We leave the rays the same so that we can see that we did this correctly. So now we're getting boom, three plus, and the array of four. So now we know that this is right. This looks absolutely perfect for what we want. I'm going to go ahead and cheat and allow Ruby to do this for us. We'll call receiver.send with the message and then the arguments. I'm going to mark that as a big old hack because we're going to revisit it a couple times. That gets us our first dot. This is good. And this actually took about this long when I was working on the first pass of this implementation. So let's go over what we have. Uh, we have subclass XP interpreter. We have instantiated a parser and defined a val to parse and then process. Uh, we've defined process lit and process call. So what exactly do we have? Essentially, an overblown calculator at this point. So let's make it more useful. Let's add conditionals and define truthiness. I'm going to go a little faster this time because we've already hit our pattern two or three times and we're going to keep going on that. So let's hit conditionals. We're going to add three assertions, uh, one for the truthy case and two for the falsy cases. And I'm going to follow Ruby's lead on this and say that uh, falsy is just nil and false. I could have said that it's just false and gone with that, and that's fine. But in this case, I'd like to follow suit. Uh, and then I'm just going to test true for the truthy case and move on. So the first thing that happens, we get unknown node type if, exactly what we'd expect to get. We go ahead and define that generically. We go ahead and look at the components. And here we can see the if node type, the condition, the true case, and the false case. So we go ahead and unpack using multiple assignment into C, T, and F. We process C, and then depending on the truthiness of C, we process either T or F. Why would we evaluate C before T and F? After all, in the call code, we went and did all the args at once. Well, if you were evaluating code like this, and it evaluated both sides before it decided which one was the real one, you'd have a bad day. <laughs> so the next thing that happens is we start uh, to process the condition case, and we can see here that we get unknown node type true and unknown node type nil. Those are easy enough. So we go ahead and define them straight up, and we use Ruby's nil and true. That gets us to the third assertion, unknown node type false, no magic here, and we get more dots. This is the test-driven process for an interpreter. You add the failing test, 
you get the error on an unknown node type. You add a generic node type so you can see the components. You get the failure on those subsex bs. You process the subsex bs. You get the test to pass, and you repeat. And it is this fast. Uh, I use something called auto tests. Other people use guard, whatever. Um, this is what it looks like when I code. I have Emacs full screened. I have the code and the test on the left, and I have a hot key to flip back and forth between them uh, intelligently based on naming convention. And on the right, I have auto test intelligently running my tests every time I save anything. It knows how to rerun just failures. When I go from a fail uh, from red to green, it reruns everything to make sure I didn't break anything else. Um, and in Emacs, uh, auto test is going to hyperlink the error lines and the stack traces in order to make them uh, clickable, and you can go straight to the code. I hope your brain hurts, because I haven't even warmed up. <laughs> Let's get on to uh, actually storing state. That's going to involve defining an environment and then uh, parsing or interpreting uh, the assignment of variables and the fetching of variables. So we do a very simple test. x equals 42, semicolon x. We expect 42 to come out of that. First thing that happens is, wait, no, we don't know what this is. We didn't ask for this. But let's just go ahead and use our regular pattern to investigate. So we define process block. We look at it. And we can see here that, yes, we had a semicolon in our code. We had multiple expressions in that code that we're interpreting. And therefore, Ruby parser wrapped that up in a block node. You can see here that we have an L assign for local variable assign and LVAR for fetch. So I'm going to follow Ruby's suit on this one as well and say that the last expression evaluated in any given piece of code is the value of that code. So we define result equals nil. We walk over all the expressions. We process each one and assign that to result. And whoever's last wins and comes out. That allows us to move on to L assign is undefined. We define it generically. We look at its components. Here we can see that it is a plain name and a value of some sort. We add a stupid table. I'm going to define something called env, and I'm going to assign a plain hash to it. And then inside process L assign, I'm going to unpack the name and the value. And then in env, I'm going to assign to the name the process of that value. That winds up with a table that looks sort of like this. Now we need to be able to read, because we've moved on to unknown node type LVAR. That's really simple. We get the name, and we access the name. Now normally, we'd want to do something here where we would warn if we were accessing something that wasn't defined before, or raise, or whatever you want for the semantics of your language. I'm just going to let it go for now. And we get more dots. <laughs> My brain hurts, but that's because I'm uncaffeinated. It does get better, because we're moving on to functions, the real meat. So let's move on to functions and get this going. So let's start off with something really simple. Double of n is 2 times n. Call double 21 and expect 42. So the first thing that happens is exactly what we expect, unknown node type defin. We define that generically. We look at its components. We can see here that we have the node type, the name double, an argument node with plain names in it, and then whatever code follows. We go ahead and unpack that using uh, multiple assignment. Uh, we splat out the body, because there could be multiple expressions in there. And because this is a function that we're not running right now, we're going to be storing it to run later, we're not going to process it. Instead, we're going to save off the body raw, along with the arguments, and put that in the environment. And that looks something like this. Here we can see that double is an array with args n, and then an array of the code of the body. Next thing that happens is we call double 21, except that we get a no method error, undefined method double for nil. But if we look at the stack trace, we can see that we are in process call where we would expect to be, but we're hitting that send. We're hitting that send on nil. What's happened is uh, there is no receiver. We're calling double of 21. There's nothing on the front. Uh, normally, that might be self, but in our case, that's just nil. So what we want to do is we want to isolate that case based on the receiver. I'm going to wrap that up in if receiver. If we do have a receiver, we go ahead and, and execute that. I mark it as less of a hack now. And in the other case, we're going to raise. And we can see that we isolated our error. So <clears throat> bear with me here. 
Now we add code to call a user method. But what does that really entail? When you call any function, uh, the first thing that happens is the arguments to that function wind up being local variables in your current scope. That's what this code is doing. So we unpack the declarations of the function and the body using multiple assignment from the env. And then we run a blob of code, which I'm going to go into in a sec, and then we can process the block of code. So <clears throat> I'm sure you're thinking this to some extent, uh, but let's go into it. Um, we have this code that we're calling, double of 21. We have the arguments, which are now values. We've already had interpreted the values. And we have the declaration for the function. So we go ahead and take that code and get the names of the declarations and zip them against the values of the call. That looks something like this, nzip21 each do. And that winds up looking like this, m sub n equals 21. And as you can see here, we already had n in our environment, and we have assigned over that. While it gets our test to pass, what it really means is that we just need more tests. So let's fix that. Let's move on to Fibonacci, make this harder. So we define test fib with our usual definition, and then expect that fib 6 is going to return 8. And what happens is it runs this time, first time ever, but we don't get the result that we expect. We get three instead of eight. So remember that stupid table? Something was in there, and it got overwritten, and that can happen multiple times. So what happens is we start off with n8, we call fib6. Because fib's argument is n, that's going to overwrite the table to six. Fib4 gets called when it recurses, happens again, and so on. What we actually want is for that environment to be smart about where we are in our code. We want a stacked hash. We want it to, on each call, look like a flattened version of that original hash, but we want it to maintain that stack as we go along so that as we pop back out, we get our previous results. We're going to call that the environment class. We're going to make it so that assignments happen to the top of the, of the stack at all times, but fetches will happen anywhere. That code looks like this. You don't need to understand this code. All you need to understand is that gets will call all and read from everything, that assignments will call last to assign to the top, that all will flatten and the newest one wins, and that we have a method, a helper method called scope, which pushes on a new scope, yields to the code, and then makes sure that that scope gets popped back off so we never uh, have a misstack. We're going to go ahead and replace our stupid hash with environment, and then we're going to take our calls and wrap them up in that scope helper. That's going to allow the recursion to go down and pop all the way back up and have the right values at each step. Finally, we get all of our dots. So at this point, to show that we have something solid, and because I have more time, uh, and to make this Turing complete, um, let's tie everything together with a, a much harder uh, construct, or a much harder test, a uh, pretty easy construct overall. Um, that's going to tie a lot of the other concepts together and really just wrap this up. Um, this section took me about 10 minutes to implement, another 20 minutes for the slides. So the fact that the slides are harder than the implementation says something. So we refactor Fibonacci, and then we add a new test, test while sum of fibs. And what we want to do is we want to calculate the sum of the Fibonacci series from 1 to 10. As you can see here, we're using local variables, we're using primitive calls, we're using recursive user calls, and all of that's heavily using the environment across everything. Next thing that happens is we get the unknown node type while, as we expect. We go ahead and define it generically. We look at the subsex piece, we see the while node type, we see the condition code, and then we see the body of code for the actual uh, loop, and then we have this uh, true artifact that comes from Ruby parser, and we're going to ignore that for now. Uh, that defines whether or not this is a pre or post while condition, and we're not going to support that. We're only supporting one form. So we unpack into cond and splat body. We pop off that true. Then while we can process cond to a truthy uh, value, we go ahead and process block and wrap up body into a block and run it. That works the first time through. Not necessarily something we've seen before, but it is that simple. So what have we done? We've written 
a fairly small amount of code. Uh, we've subclassed XP interpreter. We've instantiated a parser and an environment. We've defined a val. We've processed blocks, calls, uh, methods, or functions, uh, false, if, lsign, lit, lvar, nil, true, and while. We've defined a stacked hash, and we've written some tests for all of this. The Ubi language supports basic numeric types, true, false, and nil. It supports conditional branching and looping. It has primitive functions and user-defined functions, which can be recursive. It has local variables and variable scoping. It is test-driven. It is extensible. It is a patterns-based design. It took about two hours to write the first implementation of it. It's about 130 lines of implementation, about 70 lines of test, and most importantly, it fits in one head. What else can we do with this? We can add richer types. We can add strings, arrays, hashes, graphs, uh, any type of thing you want to add to it. Uh, we can enforce different scoping rules, like Ruby's def doesn't see outer locals, and ours does, so ours is a lot more like scheme. We can implement recursive tail calls. We can add an object system. We can change the way functions are called themselves. For further study, I highly recommend the structure and interpretation of computer programs. Uh, to this day, Gerald Sussman has given the best talk I've ever been to. Uh, the signal and noise is through the roof, and we had five people collaboratively editing one text document trying to keep up with him. It was hard. Uh, afterwards, you get to say that you know SICP. <laughs> I also highly recommend The Little Schemer and The Seasoned Schemer. These books are written in Socratic dialogue. In and of itself, that's weird, and you need to read it just to get uh, uh, a notion of what that means. They start from absolute scratch. You don't have to know any Lisp or scheme whatsoever to get started. And by the time you're done, you're Jim Wyrick because you actually know the Y Combinator. <laughs> There's a follow-up book called the, Se the Reason Schemer, and that implements a prologue-like inference system on top of scheme. If you get the chance, uh, grab this book, and then immediately, before you even open it, go watch. Uh, it was Friedman and Bird gave a talk at ClojureConf last year, which was mind-boggling. They, uh, they run this interpreter through a prologue inference system to have it derive code for the result they want. Think about that. Um, I'm assuming that I have no time for questions, so please grab me in the hallway. Thank you. Because I do have two minutes left, I'm going to do a little uh, bonus round. Um, I love this typeface. Uh, it kills me every time I look at it. I think it has absolutely gorgeous lettering and even more gorgeous ligatures. Um, so what I did instead of working on this talk is I wrote some uh, Ruby code to score all the words in the English language for how ligatured they can be. And in doing so, figured out that one of the top five words is anti-productivity. <laughs> It might have been a clue. So as promised, some of my foster kittens. This was, this was my last batch. Thank you. You want to do some questions? Yeah, do some questions. Let's do some questions. How do you Ubi? In what sense? Is, it, is, it, is there a gem somewhere that we can actually call it? I do not have a gem out there. I can do that this afternoon. Um, I do have the PDF up there. I tweeted it last night on my the underscore Zen Spider Twitter account. Um, does anyone know the person who owns Zen Spider? Can you punch him. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Hands? Back? The question is, with the environment class that I have, adding closures wouldn't actually be all that difficult, would it? The answer is no, it probably would not. If you have it so that a given uh, closure construct can point to the stack at the time that it was created, 
then it would keep that reference alive forever and would act as its environment. Uh, yeah, it should totally work. Uh, I might have my stack operating in the wrong direction. We might have to change the environment class a little bit so that it would actually fan out its tree. But other than that, it should work. Anyone else? Brains ploded. Yes, very much. Okay, now because I came to the system <clears throat> and entered 2.999 minutes for my uh, lightning talk, <clears throat> I win. Um, We'll talk real quick about fuzzy duplication detection in Flay. Um, so who here knows what Flay is? Who here has never heard of Flay? You guys are in for a treat. OK. So who's heard of Flog? Actually, wait, I don't care about those hands. Of the people who raised your hands that have never heard of Flay, who has heard of Flog? Two, three, four. Awesome. Even better. Go look at both. Um, I'm only going to talk about Flay. So what is Flay? Flay detects duplicate, meaning identical code in Ruby. Um, it detects structurally similar code, which is a little confusing as to what that might mean. It is actually language independent. It does work on ASTs generically. It doesn't actually care what language it was originally. It does work out of the box with Ruby and ERB. It could work with Haml or anything else. Um, JavaScript, C, all those things are possible. As long as there's a parser for it in Ruby, we can hook it up. So what does structurally similar mean? These two things are structurally similar. They are not the same code. They do not come up with the same results. But they are candidates for refactoring if you want to. Uh, Flay points these two things out as possible candidates for refactoring. So for fun, let's pick on Rails. It's easy pickings. If we go ahead and Flay Rails, so Flay, um, Scores basically will give you a number and then details if you ask for it on the structural similarities and the duplicate code in your code base. It'll give you a number. That number is only meaningful relative to more runs against the same code. Those things are not absolute values. You can't co compare one person's project's flay value to another person's project's flay value. That's meaningless. But over time, your project will have flay go up or down, and that's actually very, very useful. Right now, uh, Flace uh, scores Rails at a whopping uh, just less than 73,000. Shoot for zero. Zero is a good score. <clears throat> it points out that the number one worst thing in it is the identical code found across all of those files, which looks, oops, looks like this. Um, and you know, you look at that code for a little bit and you think, well, you know what? That might actually be useful for other people writing tests. Maybe we should refactor this. The answer is, duh. <laughs> it should probably be available in uh, the, the generic test case uh, that's available in Rails so that everyone can take advantage of it, because time zones are kind of a bitch. It also points out similar code across files. Doesn't matter where the code is, it can figure it out, and if you want, it can show you the similarities with a kind of an n-way diff. Um, this code is the same uh, across about 100 lines with the three exceptions. I don't have room to show the third one. And the exceptions are really, really straightforward. So this is a very good candidate for refactoring. In fact, this is a very good candidate for subclassing. Such a hard concept. So, I've added this thing recently. I haven't published it, but I've, I've been working on this thing that I'm calling fuzzy uh, detection. So given this code, def A, B, and C, right now Flay will say, you know what? A and C are very similar. Uh, while they don't, it doesn't, Flay doesn't care about names. It cares about structure. And the AST for def A looks very similar to the AST for def C. They have the same number of calls and the same structure overall. B, however, despite the fact that it is only one statement different from A, does not get reported. And I've been wondering how to do that for a while. Um, well, I've added it, and uh, it winds up doing things like this. It will say that uh, this block of code four times in this file uh, are pretty close to each other and that three of them had to be modified, in this case, by only one expression to make it the same as something else. 
So if we look at that code, we can see that we have this test here and that test there. So the only thing that changes between them are the test name, that only value, and one assert not nil. That could be easily refactored and made much cleaner. So when we do Flay Rails, we get 72,947. When we do it with Fuzzy, we get 82,411, or an increase of nearly 9,500. Um, I'm not done with this yet. I'm not really ready to publish it yet. I'm still doing um, attacks on the code to try to make it uh, more useful and faster. Um, but it's coming along, and I would love to demonstrate it to anyone who wants to see it. Thank you.